there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. This guy, the first thing he does is shoot people. I ran out in the lobby, grabbing people out of the line of fire. Lock the door, keep the kids back. He told us why he was doing this, and it was to die. He really wanted to have somebody die that day. was a big day in my, my life, a game changer. We'd opened a new office on 2nd and Columbia, been there about three weeks, so kind of getting used to the new digs. I was the uh, trustee for my dad who had Alzheimer's and he had a whole bunch of stock certificates that he was keeping in his little stash. And I said, Dad, I think we got to get these to Charles Schwab where he had his accounts. I worked in corporate security the last 18 years of my career for Charles Schwab Corporation, and I was their director and then vice president of corporate security. I worked, luckily, with the police department to help develop a training for their first responders in response to an active shooter incident. And so we put together the first training program that they had that actually brought together police, fire, and medical. I worked homicide for seven years. I did basically everything you can do. I've been in a shooting, worked hostage, worked homicide. Anytime an incident of any importance happened, they'd call me, whether, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was sitting fairly close to a little office right off the lobby. So I, I heard a couple pops and I'm thinking, this is kind of strange. There was a lot of background noise and we had uh, air conditioning ducts and everything. So sometimes you're not used to what the norm was. We had a mail slot outside that was banging away every once in a while and that might imitate a gunshot. And I, I poked my head around the corner. I saw a gunman lower his assault rifle and I believe it was the SKS assault rifle with the barrel clip, and I knew something was not right. Unbeknownst to me, roughly about two o'clock, a gunman had come in in the parking garage, and he decided to shoot up the place. And he shot two people down there. So much smoke that when he jumped on the elevator, he uh, tripped the fire alarm, and all the elevators are programmed to go to the main floor. Well, he was wanting to go to the upper floor to shoot people up there. The smoke from the shooting has put the elevators on lockdown. The gunman has a change in plans, now looking for hostages on the main floor. I ran out in the lobby grabbing people out of the line of fire. He had a lady and he, he dropped the gun down, pulled the trigger and it jammed. And she just jetted out of there. When police respond to an active shooter type incident, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is isolate that area, contain that area, gather intelligence on who's involved, who's responsible, 
uh, who the victims are and who the uh, perpetrator is. Obviously try and talk to the people exiting the building, trying to get that preliminary information from them to identify uh, and get a description of the active shooter um, and where they may be in that location. My pager started going off, going crazy, and the dispatchers just said that there was, had been a shooting, that two people had been shot, and there was a hostage deal going at Charles Schwab. Generally, you'll have a guy threatening to shoot people or threatening to shoot themselves or whatever. This guy, the first thing he does is shoot people. Ken walked by telling all of us, don't look now, but there's a guy with a gun in the, in the lobby, which was right on the other side of the glass from me. What I did immediately was I went to the next cubicle and went underneath the desk. There was a couple ladies behind me and they were crouched down at a desk and I was hiding behind this little fern tree just kind of seeing what the action was and the gunman had popped a couple rounds off so I planted my feet just like old linebacker and I said ladies go ahead and take off get out of here I'll take the bullet and they ran around uh, one went the wrong way one went the right way and the gunman was kind of looking around and he fired a couple rounds at the same time our branch manager was ushering a large number of people out of the branch, out the back door. And he actually had to time it very carefully because as uh, the subject went into our building, he was trying to get out the back door, but they both of those doors were in the same hallway. If he'd have gone too soon, they'd have been seen. In a way, I was a decoy in a way because, because he was focusing on me. 15 plus people ran out the back door. So he was focusing so much on what I was doing. Ken says, no, no, don't go there, go in this room. And so we went in the room. I hid behind a little bookcase and squatted down on the floor because I thought, oh, this tiny room, and if anything ricochets, I don't want to get it. As I'm running out, the gunman comes in into our little office there with the hostage. I run back into the office. I call 911. The gunman comes over to our office here and says, open the door or I'll blow it open. A gunman enters the parking garage, shooting the first two people he sees. And he jumps out on the main floor. He'd taken one person hostage. And I, I poked my head around the corner, and I saw a gunman lower his assault rifle, ran out in the lobby, grabbing people out of the line of fire. Ken walked by telling all of us, don't look now, but there's a guy with a gun in the, in the lobby. The dispatchers just said that there was, had been a shooting, that two people had been shot, and there was a hostage deal going at Charles Schwab. He had a lady, and he, he dropped the gun down, pulled the trigger, and it jammed, and she just jetted out of there. At the same time, our branch manager was ushering a large number of people out of the branch, out the back door. Ken says, no, no, don't go there, go in this room. The gunman comes over to our office here and says, open the door or I'll blow it open. It can be very difficult to um, quickly identify a shooter in this situation. Essentially, you're gonna be listening for the sounds of gunshots and you're gonna be going towards those sounds to try and really identify this person quickly and end the threat there's active shooting, active killing going on, you are listening, and that's that's how we train. You listen for the shots, and wherever that is, that's where you go. So I take the uh, receiver and put it on the desk, still with 911, so they could listen to what's going on. And then Ken gave us a running account. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, and then he opened the door. <laughs> I opened the door. Uh, inside the office is uh, Kathy and Muriel, uh, a couple ladies. One was a worker, one was a, uh, 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 one of our customers. And Wendy uh, uh, was in front of his gun. She was crying and he told her to shut up or else she would die. 
at first it was uh, very terrifying because he laid out the big bullets, you know, he had a lot of ammunition and he was tense and, and nervous. He told us uh, why he was doing this and it was to die. He bought guns in Oregon because they're easiest to get and then he went to an attorney to see uh, what he had to do to qualify for the death penalty. The uh, attorney told him he had to kill at least three people. And so by the time he came to us, he thought he had killed three people. He researched the methods of dying in the states, and he chose Oregon. And so he said, well, I just want to be able to t be taken properly. The gunman was getting kind of agitated. And he was shooting out windows and stabbing the desk and stabbing the walls. I was trying to calm him down. And, and get a little, uh, some thread of uh, commonality, try to cool him down. It was just a roller coaster. I was there pretty quick. I just parked my unmarked police car with the lights going in the middle of the street. And the first thing I did was run over to uh, where I knew there was a daycare, and I told them to shut all the blinds and lock the door and um, keep the kids back. This was unique because it was at Charles Schwab, which is known internationally, and it was right next to, in the same building as Channel 6, the CBS affiliate. So we had all these things going on. So you think, you're not just worried about talking to the hostage taker and doing that. You've got to set up a perimeter. You've got to block traffic. I got a phone call from our human resources department who had received a call from one of their human resources employees. And she told them that there was somebody with a gun. And they said they would call security, so they called me um, and asked me what we knew, did have we heard anything. And we talked for a couple of minutes very quickly and said, no, we, we don't have anything on that yet, but let me call a branch and find out. I know some people up there. Maybe it was somebody on the street. Maybe it was somebody, a uh, police officer, you know. You don't know what a report of a gun means. So we called directly to the branch, and a gentleman answered the phone. And I asked, who's this? And he said, this is James, who are you? So I take the uh, receiver and put it on the desk, still with 911. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, and then he opened the door. And Wendy was in front of his gun. She was crying, and he told her to shut up or else she would die. He told us uh, why he was doing this, and it was to die. He went to an attorney to see uh, what he had to do to qualify for the death penalty. The uh, attorney told him he had to kill at least three people. It was just a roller coaster. The first thing I did was run over to uh, where I knew there was a daycare and I told him to shut all the blinds and lock the door. So we called directly to the branch and a gentleman answered the phone and I asked, who's this? And he said, this is James, who are you? His main thing, he was asking about the two people he shot and he really wanted to have somebody die that day. And if those two hadn't been killed, he was gonna take Paul or one of us out. From his desk in San Francisco, Keith Hedman tries to understand the gunman's demands for taking hostages. Not getting any answers, he attempts to keep the gunman calm. And so that's where we started, was like, okay, now what are we gonna do about this? Because I've got him on the phone, and I don't know who's in there, don't know how many people, don't know what his, what his beef is, what, what's the issue? So we had to start a dialogue and try to build some rapport. Based on my experience, you're always going to have, in the beginning, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because you haven't talked to the guy yet. You don't know where his head's at. 
I signaled to uh, my administrative staff leader who was uh, in her cubicle out on the floor and to get her attention because I was on the phone with him. I couldn't hang up. I couldn't interrupt. Uh, that would have been rude and wouldn't build rapport. So I got a signal to her and we passed some notes back and forth about, you know, go let this person know, let that person know and keep people out of here. It turned out that his beef wasn't with our company. It was with a company elsewhere in the building, but he couldn't get there. So he ended up grabbing people in the first space he could get to safely because the uh, Portland police were already beginning to surround the building. He wanted to, to deal with the hostages and I said, okay, look, let me let the police department know what's going on so that everybody can be safe. I will call you back in 10 minutes. I started trying to get information. I contacted the Portland Police Department and said, here's what we have. Here's what's going on. Here's who I am. I'm talking with him and working with him and trying to gain his trust. The best thing is to start talking to somebody uh, because even if they're in a bad mood or whatever, if they start talking to you, you know, you got a hook in them. And if they just keep talking, that's what you want. I went to the command post, you know, got the latest information. One, figure out what happened. Two, get to the people that needed medical attention. Three, get the perimeter going. Four, manage the media. It was a big deal. We used the Marriott Hotel, which was just a couple blocks away. So we were in, I think, a banquet room or something like that, and running wires all over the place and, and all that kind of stuff. There could have been 100 cops around there. I mean, some two blocks away, trekked in traffic, and others sitting there crawling through the building. Ultimately, my job was to sit in front of the one narrow window that was in front of the desk where he was sitting, and that was so that the cops couldn't shoot him through the window. Uh, so we, in the office, we had three ladies and myself over in the corner. So I was trying to calm him down. He hated banks, he hated insurance. It was reading his demeanor, his emotions, his actions and trying to, uh, because I couldn't see him, I had to do a lot of listening. We were on the phone, uh, and he was telling me he wanted to let them call their loved ones. One of the pieces of intelligence that the police have is that this hostage taker is allowing his hostages um, and demanding they phone their family and say their goodbyes. This clearly sends a message that he's got a deliberate plan in place and he wants to carry through with that. So from a police perspective, that is going to expedite a lot of our actions or a lot of the police's actions and how they're going to uh, follow through or take the next steps in trying to resolve this. And I said, okay. And I said, you're going to let them all call, right? So we're going to figure how many, you know, how long do they get to talk? What's going on? And he told me, give them a couple of minutes each, and we figured it out. And I said, okay, I'm going to call you back uh, at, at a certain time. If everybody's done, you call me, please. Um, and when I hung up the phone, what ran through my mind was what people in the industry have called an end game. This was his end game. In other words, they were going to call their families, tell them they loved them, and then he may end up killing everybody. He really wanted to have somebody die that day. He was going to take all or one of us out. Now, what are we going to do about this? Because I've got him on the phone, and I don't know who's in there, don't know how many people, don't know what his, what his beef is. Trying to calm him down, he hated banks, he hated insurance. We were on the phone uh, and he was telling me he wanted to let them call their loved ones. This was his end game. In other words, they were gonna call their families, tell them they loved them, and then he may end up killing everybody. 
About an hour into the hostage incident, he said, uh, I'm going to let you call your loved ones, and this will be your last call. He wanted to kill somebody that day. One by one, the gunman permits the hostages to make their phone calls. I warned him that he was going to have to go through a whole bunch of secretaries to get to my husband. He only knew me as Muriel, and he had trouble pronouncing it. So he mentioned Muriel wants to speak to him. And because the secretary detected that the name was pronounced wrong, she says, oh, yeah, right. Well, that's when he shot off more guns. And, and I think all of us went deaf at that time. Some of them thought it was a joke. And then he popped off a couple rounds, and this, this is no joke. And she ran out screaming in the hall at my husband. I find out from my husband, saying, Miss, 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 quick, quick, quick. And so he came back, and I said, hello, dear. I said, I'm a hostage at a coin building, and I just wanted, we've been given five minutes to say goodbye. And I said, um, uh, dear, you're the greatest thing that ever happened, and tell the boys they were worth it. And my husband just, uh, his heart completely stopped there for a moment. When it came to me, I wanted to get information to the police. I called uh, my wife at the time, and we chatted a little bit, tell the kids that I loved, loved them. Um, this guy has an AK-47, an SKS, uh, and I was listening. I had, it sounds like he had a thousand rounds of ammo, because it, 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 he had a couple duffel bags, and one of them looked like, a, or sounded like a bunch of marbles hitting the desk. So he's, he's a pack to just, you know, destroy a lot of people. So uh, by sending that information and uh, a little bit about him, he wanted to be secretive, but it says his name is James, gave her enough information that she hopefully got back to the police and uh, they can get a somewhat a description, maybe a background on the guy. They had people who could kind of see in to the branch and could, could kind of monitor any escalation um, and we're, we're ready to respond to it. The next phone call, he wanted to talk to his doctor. We had no idea who it was, but I get him, I got him to give us a name that we would then try to locate. One of the things he told me was he was very concerned that he saw all these police officers outside. And he was very concerned that they were going to come rushing in there and end up shooting him. So. I told him I would try to work on that. Can't promise, but let's see what we can do to make sure that they don't do that. And uh, I will get them to try and locate this doctor. But I, I don't know whether he didn't think at, during this phone call that we were taking him seriously. I think he just adrenaline and wanted to prove himself. So he fired a couple of rounds into the ceiling. And he said, I want you to take me seriously. I assured him we did, no question about it. And then I said I'd call him back again. At first, he made me stand there. And then I think it was Ken who said, uh, you know, she might be getting tired. Uh, should I get her a chair? And so I got a chair, and the rest of the time I sat in a chair. When he would get an off vibe from one of us, uh, particularly Ken, that, uh, you know, you'd see him just tense up like crazy. I finally uh, pulled out, his first name was James. Um, so I like to talk eye to eye to person. And I started uh, looking at him, you know, halfway in. He said, if you turn your head over again, I'm gonna blow your head off. So I was trying to pull out just a little background. You know, he'd, he'd ask a few questions and so on and so forth, and you know, family and just little bits and pieces. I think he went to school in Utah or someplace, and then he was in Portland. And he was just uh, really an angry a young gentleman. He was 25 at the time. James Rinker hated insurance companies, banks, and women. That was the third one. Here's a guy, 25, uh, balding, overweight. Uh, he was having troubles, I'm guessing, but he hated women. And I remember one incident in particular. I'm standing over there 
and the gunman says, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. A uh, gunman had come in in the parking garage, and he decided to shoot up the place. Ken walked by telling all of us, don't look now, but there's a guy with a gun in the, in the lobby. The gunman comes over to our office here and says, open the door or I'll blow it open. He said, uh, I'm going to let you call your loved ones, and this will be your last call. I gave him five minutes to say goodbye, and I said, Dear, you're the greatest thing that ever happened, and tell the boys they were worth it. When it came to me, I wanted to get the information to the police. I called uh, my wife at the time and gave her enough information that she hopefully got back to the police. And he said, I want you to take me seriously. I assured him we did. No question about it. I was standing over there, and the gunman says, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. found out later what he'd done, he put the gun in his mouth and he was going to pull the trigger. And he didn't. But he was talking, he was getting a little information from the other ladies, a little background and, you know, what they did and names. And Wendy did something pretty smart. Uh, all of the, of the other three, myself and the other two ladies, had families and kids and so on and so forth. Wendy was a uh, uh, single 23-year-old, no kids. So she made up that, yeah, she's married. She has a kid. She was trying to keep a level field. I'm still in front of the window, and he asked me every once in a while what's happening. And I said, well, there are no cars going by. And he said, I said, so they must have blocked off the road. And he said, yeah, no, yeah, that's right. And then he said, well, do you see any uh, policemen out there? And, of course, I did. I saw them underneath the car. There was a car lot across the street, and I saw them underneath the car. And I said, no, no. And I figured that, that uh, if he looked out there, I said, oh, I didn't see that one. TV people, um, media people from not only the US, but from everywhere, just standing around waiting now, that was a big story. And then I went back out and, and went to where we had tape across the road where all these reporters were. And then I was running back and forth, trying to keep up on what was going on and letting people know, letting people know to stay away because you don't want people coming down just to be part of the action. We passed the doctor's name and what we thought was an address or phone number off to Portland police and they went to try and locate. When we talked about not having them rush the building. I told him that I had talked to them about that and I felt comfortable that they weren't gonna do that. But we needed to give them something. Jim, you have to give me something to give them. A show of good faith. And I said, now I've gotta give them something. Give me a hostage. Let me have a hostage to, to give them, to show them that you're negotiating on this on, on good faith. And he then agreed to let one hostage go. And he chose that one hostage. Um, and I believe he chose that person because that person posed the most threat to him. So he wanted to get them out. Keith passes the message from police to the gunman, looking for a sign he's now willing to negotiate. There was a lot of back and forth with the police department because we had to know exactly who was coming out, how they were going to be dressed, how they were gonna walk, where they were gonna go. And so we got all of those specifics from the police department. Another little bit more, he says, I'm going to give a peace offering. Ken, I want you out of here. He knew that if he was gonna screw around with any ladies or, or take somebody out, I was gonna act. I'm sure it was because Ken was a threat to him, and uh, and he was okay with with having a hostage. And he said, just to show you how much I'm I'm okay now. He said, I'm going to send Ken out with a gun. So, uh, Ranker gave me the gun to give to Ken as he was going out the door. 
when I was told that I had to hold a gun, and so I, I did it, you know, like that, because I don't know anything about guns, and I don't ever want to have my hands on one. Got their dispatcher on the phone, said the same thing, he's coming out, this is what he's going, but there's going to be a shotgun. I mean, you, do, you don't want to surprise a bunch of police officers out there with weapons who are expecting one thing and then find something else. For all they know, this guy could have been a gunman. The gunman showed me a, a pistol grip Mossberg shotgun, open chamber, and wanted me to carry that out uh, as a peace offering. He says, okay, I'm gonna let you go. And as I'm walking out, I turned to him and said, trade, let's trade. Let the girls go, I'll stay. And he said, no, you're out of here. Before I left, the gunman says, Ken, I respect you. And just that, that term, and, term right there. Because my gut feeling, finding out later, it, you know, he'd been abandoned by his father, and I was last man out. I was going to stick it out till the end. And so, uh, glass all over the place. And I marched in Iron Cross fashion about 20 feet to the little bit to the left. And I thought, all right, I'm out of here. And then I go around the corner. I'm, I'm guessing they're M16s. They're called CERT team here instead of SWAT. But uh, two CERT team members had their long rifles uh, trained on me. I thought, oh, crap. I've gotten through all this and now, but uh, I was hoping the picture came through, told me to drop the weapon, face on the ground, they handcuffed me. And I got a couple more feet and they started jabbering a little bit and said, can you point the gunman out where he is and everything like that. So when I, uh, my hands were behind my back, I said, well, I can use my nose, but can you take the uh, cuffs off me? So they did. Uh, my branch manager, Jim was close by because I somehow they got the word that I was a good guy, not the bad guy. From there, zip to the police station a few blocks down, and they start asking me, What does this guy look like? But the funny thing is, I'm walking to where was going to be my little room to help out with the negotiation process. I overlooked and saw something on one of the computer screens, and that was a dead ringer for what he looked like. He started throwing different pictures at me. I said, no, 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 but the one I, as I was walking through, it was that guy on the computer. I said, oh, which one? Oh, there, that guy over there has the good diagram of him. Oh, okay, so um, got that much. And then I was just boom to boom, just telling him as much background, what's going on, and they asked me, uh, kind of a quirky question, what did the, the women dress, because they were worried that if he switched clothes and raced out of there, they weren't sure if there's going to be a rush situation, throw him off for a second, but um, described all the, what's going on, and bites and all that, so they have a good description of the other hostages. So I try to really step up my game, give them as much information, so uh, you know, in case of a uh, you know, bad situation, they rushed it, and they'd take out the bad guy versus uh, take one of the hostages. I'd be back in the command post and then back out on the street um, talking to the media folks that were all gathered. And you know, they're getting up into the parking garages nearby shooting video. So I had to admonish anybody shooting live because I didn't know if there was a TV in Charles Schwab that this guy could watch and see where our guys were going. They're gonna pester you and they're gonna ask questions that make no sense. But uh, I was a TV reporter for three years, so I've been on the other side of the fence. And it's just that they're trying to get as much information as they can. And I'm giving out the least information I can. And my focus is safety. Telling people, you know, don't drive down here. Don't walk down here. Stay away. In these high stakes type incidents, when police release information to the media 
there's a very fine line in releasing what's necessary information opposed to too much information that could only perhaps escalate the situation and make it a little bit more difficult to resolve. I had received word from Portland that they were ready to take it over, which was fine, except that I had promised him earlier that I would call him back in 10 minutes at a specific time. And if I had learned anything in all of this, it was don't lie, do what you say you're going to do and be honest with them. And I knew I'd built a rapport, so if I didn't tell him what was happening and keep my promise to call him back, we could lose him. So I called Portland PD back and I said, look, I can't turn it over yet. I promised him I would call him back and I am going to do that regardless. And the person on the phone said, well, you can't do that. We need to take it over now. They're ready. And I just basically said, I think you need to talk to your negotiator or your commander. Tell them what I've told you, and then I'll, I will abide by what they say. The police agree to wait, putting their negotiator on the phone. They let Keith call James the gunman and hopefully bring a conclusion to this turbulent day. And I did talk to him, told him that they were going to be uh, calling him, that they would be taking over, but I promised him that I would be on that same phone number we had been using for two hours. And if there was anything he needed, if he felt threatened, if he felt something was wrong, whatever, he just wanted to talk but not to them, absolutely call me and I would sit there until this was completely resolved safely and that he was safe. And then I told them, go ahead and take it over. And he then agreed to let one hostage go. Ken, I want you out of here. I'm sure it was because Ken was a threat to him. I'm, I'm okay now. He said, I'm going to send Ken out with a gun. And I thought, all right, I'm out of here. And then I go around the corner, and two certain team members had their long rifles uh, trading on me. I thought, oh, crap. Told me to drop the weapon, face on the ground. They handcuffed me. Somehow they got the word that I was a good guy, not the bad guy. I had received word from Portland that they were ready to take it over. Then when the phone calls got to be with a negotiator, things really changed. He would answer questions and I couldn't tell you what the questions were. We could see the guy literally change before our very eyes. And the guy he spoke to was the guy who really saved us. He had to describe for the SWAT team uh, who was coming out and gave a physical description. And he said, uh, she looks like a professional woman in midlife, maybe 150 pounds, and that's when I went, ah! And uh, everybody laughed in the room. And then Rinker said, no, 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 I don't know anything about weights. No, it couldn't be that, it couldn't be that. <laughs> But I think uh, I had everybody else tell me that that moment was a real icebreaker for them. The gunman decides to let the hostages go. One by one, they are freed after being held at gunpoint for hours. Once Ken got out and then I got out, the rest were fast coming. So I walk out and when I get to the, the entry of Charles Schwab, which is the lobby of the coin building, uh, the SWAT team uh, have all their guns, you know, pointed and, and they give you orders then. And you have to, I believe I had to raise my hands and walk toward them. And then I had to turn around to get patted down. And then they took me away to the police station. It was very rewarding to see that all of the hostages were out and safe. It was very rewarding even to see him come out, taken into custody by police, and, you know, they followed protocol, but they treated him with a lot of respect. I mean, they didn't throw him around or anything like that. They did their protocol for pat down and taking him into custody and all that, but it went very well. And just to watch that, and then they you saw them drive off and everybody was like, yay, it's over. And I, I started realizing at that point 
that the best feeling I had was that from the moment I took over, he had shot two people in the loading dock, but from the moment I took over, nobody else had been shot or injured in any way. Following an incident like this, you're going to want to find out what the motives were of this individual, why he carried out these acts. And you're going to do that through speaking with witnesses, speaking with people that uh, he's acquaintances with, friends with, to understand why he did what he did. Details on James Rickner's attempts on his own life later surface. Even while in custody, he's made at least one more attempt to take his life. He had tried to get out, but he got in an area where there was he wanted to be shot, and there was, it was an area where he was completely safe, so they didn't do it. And I thought, oh my goodness, uh, he never got what he wanted. He wanted to die very badly. The first time he was committed, he committed himself in high school. And then, the, and the, then there were two other times, and I'm not sure they were both by his own volition. It's a relief when it's finally over. Um, it's a big relief because the whole time, everybody's tense uh, and not knowing what this guy's going to do. You feel pretty good at the end of one of these things, whether it's a small one or a big one like this. I think back, you know, as people talk about moments in your career and stuff like that, there's got to be a top dog for me on this one. And uh, it does go through a lot, particularly you hear something on the news and it automatically keys back memories and you think about it. And about nine months later was the trial and I had to see him all over again. And, um, and I brought back some memories. I still have a little of uh, post-traumatic, just a splash. And uh, one of my main things in life is uh, make a difference. I've done some volunteer work uh, sometimes just that act of kindness to people, maybe that's going to make the difference in somebody's day and you don't know it. <laughs>